All right, so again, if you're just getting logged in, um, go ahead and put your name and organization in the chat box. Say hello so we can get to know you. We are excited to have Emily here, our very own from Bridge Innovate, to talk to us about social impact. All right, so we have a lot to get through, so let's go ahead and just get started. So um, today we have, again, like I said, Emily Skywork, um, one of our very own, a consultant here at Bridge, um, doing innovation for social impact. Um, this is our Inspire series. So this is a really um, awesome event that we do with Bridge just for innovation for good, where we um, discuss leadership and capacity and strategy and all the things that inspire us as leaders um, in today's world. And so we do these 30 minute webinars every few weeks to kind of share insights and thoughts and experiences um, from our connections around our community. Um, if you don't know us, we are Bridge Innovate. We are a business innovation consulting firm um, out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. So we do a lot of work um, nationally and some internationally with businesses on building innovation and growth. And um, yeah, we have a lot to get through today. So let's go ahead and hop right in. We have Emily Rose Skywork here. So Emily is a consultant and delivery services lead here at Bridge Innovate. Um, she has a background in public health and social impact. Um, she has been doing design thinking for a while now. So prior to joining the Bridge Innovate team, she served as the inaugural design thinking fellow for Innovate Carolina, advocating for the integration of design thinking across the University of North Carolina's campus through teaching, training, and consulting for students, faculty, and external partners. Um, she also co-developed and served as a teaching associate for the new design thinking for the public good course, which um, was offered to 54 interdisciplinary graduate students. And um, through her work at Carolina, she still is um, publishing alongside thought leaders at the forefront of human-centered design, social innovation, and rapid experimentation. And she also just does so much for us at the Bridge team, um, helping us with the Bright Spark. Um, program and client services delivery. And we are so excited to have her here. So I'll let her take it away from here. Hey everyone. Um, so you've seen that my slides can sometimes go rogue. So if you get to see ahead, congratulations. Uh, today, we're going to go over specifically a tool called design thinking as a innovation tool for social impact. We'll talk about empathy, which is key to design thinking. And one of the reasons we're going to focus on it today and then we'll spend some time talking about what you do with that empathy that you've developed, how you work through co-creation, prototyping, and testing. So first, what is design thinking? Design thinking is a problem-solving method that's used for problems in initially the design space, hence the name. So it was initially used for product design. It then became used for service design and kind of found its way out of the traditional product and design sector and into large corporations. It's now beginning to find its way into the social sector because it's because of these other characteristics. So it's a non-linear way of solving problems. Often when we solve problems, we say problem, okay, solution. And then we find all of this messy stuff in between afterwards when we're trying to implement the solution. Design thinking lets you get that messy part in the beginning. So you do this empathy work, it gets messy and it feels super nonlinear until you arrive at a solution that's really grounded in this last pillar, the needs of real people. So you develop solutions that are human centered. You have room for iteration within the design process. So you're able to constantly test and rebuild and work alongside real people. So those of you who might work in the social space are probably seeing applications of this already. The social issues we face are really complex. And so getting in the weeds early, talking to real people can be beneficial. This is an example of why we need to use human-centered design for social impact. So this is an example of an innovation called the play pump. Um, a lot of communities in Sub-Saharan Africa have trouble with access to water. And so this team of entrepreneurs came up with this idea that if we had a merry-go-round powered by children playing, they could provide water from the grounds to these communities, specifically they focus in South Africa. So over on the left-hand side of the screen here, you'll see an example of how this works. So the children play on the merry-go-round, it pumps water up, filters the water, it comes back down, and then usually women are able to get that water from the pump. Great idea, kids love to play, an eternal source of energy, and um, 
it got a lot of interest. Each pump cost $14,000, but it got funding. Major philanthropists were involved in this. The US government itself invested $10 million in this project. It was something really exciting and easy to get behind, kids playing for clean water. But humans were not involved in this project. And so what they didn't know until they spent all of this money implementing these pumps is that to meet the needs of the communities, children would need to play for 27 hours straight just to pump enough water for the communities. And if you have kids know that kids will play for about 20 minutes and then they'll find something else to do and then they'll go to sleep and then they'll find something else to do. So getting kids to play for even an hour straight on this play pump was a challenge. Forget the 27 hours needed to actually meet the needs of the community. That's impossible in a day. So these play pumps are now a challenge in communities because rather than just using a traditional hand pump, which is laborious, but not overly laborious, women in communities, as you see in these bottom pictures now, now have to, with a friend or by themselves, spin these merry-go-rounds that are falling apart and are not as helpful as a hand pump would have been. Um, they're now spinning these wheels on their own. The kids are not involved. And there's a bunch of these in communities. Now, I don't know what the human-centered design process would have yielded, but had they used the human-centered design pump, they might have found that there were solutions that maybe weren't as jazzy, but actually met the needs of people in the community. So for example, there are over 1,500 abandoned hand pumps um, in the continent of Africa. And if you had just repaired those, which had a significantly less cost, you could have then helped communities access water instead of putting all of these new pumps in that are becoming more challenging. So quick example of why human-centered design can be used for social impact. Talk to people in the beginning, fail early, figure out how to make some changes and make solutions that actually work for real people. So I vouched a little bit for design thinking. What does a design thinking solution look like? It contains these three elements. So I've talked quite a bit about the desirability, you create something that people actually want. You also have to think about feasibility, right? There's a lot of things that people want, but we can't always do it. So design thinking helps us to figure out what we can actually do. And then sustainability, something that will actually last. Um, do we have the money? Do we have the people? Do we have the capabilities to be able to implement this long-term? So something could be, Something that people really want and we might be able to do it in a burst, but if we can't hang on to it, it's not going to be a solution that lasts. So design thinking helps you find solutions right in the middle here, which is really important for social impact. People have to want it, got to be able to do it, and you have to be able to make it last. So what are some tools that you can use to get you started? First, as many of you know, in the social sector, you have to identify your stakeholders. So you need to Take some time and record who is directly involved in your challenge and who um, is involved in making sure that it works. So find your users, find the people who would actually be involved in the solution or who are actually experiencing the challenge, but also find the people who could bring it down, who might be able to build it up, who have power to be able to make this work. The other thing that you wanna do is include stakeholders who are representative of those on the margins. So there's an idea in design thinking that if you build for the extremes, build for the margins, you will find a solution that works for those in the middle. So if we think about technology, for example, if you're finding a technology solution, if you build just for people who are um, right in the middle of technology ability, right? Like they might know how to use Microsoft Suite, but they might not know how to code. Um, you might be missing other folks for whom the solution can be designed. But if you design for people at the margins, if you design for people who are amateur coders, who design their own software, design their own programs, and then you also build for those who have trouble starting a computer, have trouble with basic hardware, or basic technology, you design a solution for those folks, that solution in theory will meet the needs of the people along the spectrum, especially the advocates in the middle. So when you're building people into this process throughout this uh, talk, I'll talk about uh, getting folks involved this is who I mean. You want to get your real users involved and then focus specifically on those who are on the margins. Looks like we have a hand raised. Yeah. Thanks, Hannah. I can't see. Hi, Jenny. I see your hand raised. I just wanted to say it was a great story. And um, I love the fact that you're talking about how oftentimes people have great innovations um, with good intentions, 
that may seem, I think, sexy, right? But they really miss the mark for the actual user. So thanks for sharing the story and the attributes that we need to think about in innovation. Great, great feedback. Thanks. Thanks, Jenny. Yes, and so that's why we're going through these tools now so that you all can get closer to solutions that actually meet the needs of people. So we talked about stakeholders and identifying your stakeholders. What do you do once you have them? Um, a really basic tool, not super innovative, is interviewing. One of the reasons this is really valuable is that you're building relationships with your users, with your stakeholders. So you're having these conversations, you're proving to them that you're willing to listen. Um, it's important in those conversations that you do listen, you don't just forward your own agenda. And you develop empathy with their pain points, with their real experience, you understand past successes and failures. Maybe someone has tried to solve this before and they know a way that it failed and they can give you that information up front. How valuable is that? And you'll gain unique perspective. So an example that I'm going to use throughout here because it's published and I have the most evidence for it is a course design project that we did. We were building a design thinking course for interdisciplinary graduate students. We knew that it was going to be challenging because these students were coming from an elite university. They knew how to get good grades. They knew how to use a rubric. So we knew they would have trouble with design thinking. It's nonlinear. You're not always going to get the right rules. And so we spent a lot of time in this empathy phase, understanding what people had done before with courses like this, what experiences folks had with courses that there might not be a right answer for. And this is one of three boards that we had um, from all of the empathy work that we did. So we had three boards exactly like this. And this is just a dump of insights that came from interviews and focus groups and talking to real people and going and having experiences. So an example of what this dump of information looks like in the empathy phase. Another thing that you saw on that board was our experiences from analogous inspiration. So I think a lot of folks who have experience with research think about Googling things on a desktop and then talking to people and moving on. Um, and sometimes that's not super fun, but research can be really fun, especially when you use design thinking tools. And one of my favorites is analogous inspiration. This means that you look at the things that are similar to your experience in some key ways, but are not exactly the same. Um, you can look at examples on the internet of these things, or you can go experience them yourself. So for this course example, we knew that students would have to get to a final solution in a very nonlinear way. And we were trying to find a way to empathize with them and understand that experience. Um, and we thought that an escape room was really similar. You've got these bits of information, but you're not entirely sure which direction to go in. And so we as a research team went and did an escape room. And while that was fun, you have to go in with some really clear questions. So we went in and recorded all of our feelings, all of our experiences, what helped, what hurt, and we actually brought a lot of that into the course. Um, so we found that if we had clear directions, it really helped. We liked that everybody received the same information at the beginning, that it wasn't like some people receive more information and could get ahead. Everyone received the same blanket information. That was something we brought into our design briefs for students that everybody received the exact same information. Nobody got any extra advantages because they had a, a teacher that was giving them more info. So, this can be really fun. So think about things that are similar to your challenge or if there's a key element of it, that nonlinear piece is what we were focusing on. So we looked for experiences that were nonlinear. Another fun one is immersion. So you can go stay a, a day in the life, but it can also be an hour in the life or an experience in the life of your user. So we sat in classrooms and we felt, we wrote down how it felt to be in the classroom. What did we feel confused about? What did we observe? We were in one class where we observed that all of the students were on the computers. And so we, before COVID, decided that we would not have computers in the classroom. Um, then we had to because it took place virtually, but we saw that students were not engaged because they all had their laptops out. And so being able to see and hear and feel your experience, um, this works really well in healthcare. If you are designing a solution for folks who are experiencing the healthcare system, go do it yourself. Go to the and dig your heels in, see what you feel, see what you hear, see how you're treated. And one final one that's really helpful in the social sector is photo voice. So often it's hard to interview someone and ask about their experiences. They might not know what to tell you. They might be trying to give you the right answer. And so a really fun one is to give them a camera and have them just go through their day and take pictures of what their day looks like. If you're designing for a particular challenge, 
have them take pictures of that challenge and then bring them back in and have them talk you through the pictures. And you'll learn a lot more about their experience than if you just said, tell me about when you go to the clinic. Um, they'll be able to show you and you'll be able to see things in the pictures, ask about extra details that you might not have known to ask for. So you saw before those big boards of information. Again, I mentioned we had three for that project with the course design. What do you do with it? Um, so it's really important during empathy that you don't judge the information, you just let it rain on you. There's so much information, you let it all come in. Then when you feel like you've gathered enough, you start to develop themes. So we, you can do this with real sticky notes, you can do this any way that makes sense for you, but we dragged all of these sticky notes into clusters and labeled themes. And these became insights that we used to develop the course. I've also used this for social interventions where we hear people really need this challenge solved. And we might've thought that they were we needed to solve a different challenge for them. But what we heard over and over and over again is that the main pain point is something else and then you pivot. And how cool to be able to pivot earlier before you've developed a solution that nobody wants. So you'll see here are some of the solutions that came through. Again, this was about three times the size, but you couldn't read it. Um, we heard over and over again that students should learn by doing. So that became an insight that we applied by having three course partners and students work through a real challenge in the classroom rather than learning in abstract. Um, students also wanted explicit skill building, skills around group work, skills around communication. And so we incorporated a lot of reflection. That was another insight that might not be here um, around skills. So what skills were they building? We named the skills that they were building. We had them name the skills that they were building. And we made the rubric skills-based rather than um, did you meet the criteria of the assignments? It was instead, have you developed and demonstrated these skills? So after you have all of that information, I'm gonna check on the chat real quick. Okay, great, just uh, whoops. Um, after you have all of that insight, eventually you need to move on. It can be really fun to sit in empathy and just gain that insight, but eventually you need to move forward toward a solution. There will always be some sort of constraint and you might need to set it yourself. So it might mean that you say, we are gonna do empathy for six months. That's all the time we can give. It might mean we can spend this amount of money and then after that amount of money is spent, we've got to move on. Eventually you're gonna to have to move into co-creation, prototyping and testing, and eventually you'll have to move to implementation. So in this phase, um, we are gonna to begin to start testing and we're gonna start testing on tiny scales and then more to grand scales. And the reason we do this is so that we can fail early. You saw that play pump example. I'm not sure how many play pumps were developed, but way too much money was spent on something that failed. And so had they just developed one or had they tested this with folks using some of the tools that I gave you, um, that I will give you, they might've found really early that this wasn't gonna work and they could have made a change that would have been much more cost-effective and space effective before they implemented all of the play pumps. So doing this testing allows you to gain new insights about what's not gonna work. It also allows you identif to identify what does work. So you can lean into that and drop the things that don't work. You can also learn about new routes to implementation. I can't tell you how many times I've heard a solution come forward and you say, this is going to solve a problem for these certain people. And when you're doing this testing, you learn that you can also help all of these other people that you didn't realize this solution affected and you can increase your impact. You can also get an early second chance. So if this is gonna fail, you'll find out early before you spend all of this money, all this publicity around this solution. You can also build some emotional resilience. It's hard to hear your idea isn't gonna work. Um, it's really hard to see it on a grand scale, but if you test early and you hear in little bites that this piece won't work, but this piece will, you're building that emotional resilience and that detachment from the solution and instead continuing to ground yourself in the problem that you're trying to solve, not the solution you've come up with. It also lets you reset your focus. When you are testing, there is gonna be so much information that you wanna test. You saw those whiteboards, there was a ton on it. And that's how every project is gonna feel if you do empathy right. So what you're gonna test is your critical assumptions. So you're gonna have these things that you assume to be true about your project based on your empathy work that you've done. And so you'll wanna focus on the most critical assumptions. So what is essential for it to succeed and what do we know the least about? That's what you'll wanna test when you move forward. So to give you, a, again, a well-documented example from that course design, 
we took all of the themes and we, the ones that we knew had to be true because we heard them over and over and over again, we put into this bucket called things that must be true. So we knew that reflection had to be part of the course. We knew that group work had to be part of the course. We knew that we had to communicate really um, well with students about what the expectations were, that sometimes the expectations were just that they learned. Um, and we knew that if we involved community partners, we had to value their time. Then we realized that there were these eight key pieces that we did not know much about and that were critical for the course's success. So we didn't know, we knew we had to do group work, but we didn't know what it would look like. Did students do one big group project throughout the course? Um, we knew that we wanted community partners involved, but to what degree? Were community partners teaching? Were they bringing case studies to the class? Um, what was their involvement like? And so we built out these decision points and then each team member built a concept for the course. So they picked one of the options from each of these decision points and built out what the course looked like. And then we continued to do some work testing what these assumptions would look like. We built them out using some of the tools that I'll show you. So one of the key ones is to build low fidelity prototypes. This is an example of technology. So before you develop, you engage an app developer, just build out the most basic version of your prototype. So what are you testing? What do you need to know? And then build out just that and nothing else. And it's a key at this stage as well as every other that you involve real people in testing. So it's helpful for your internal team to test to just see what things look like. It might help you realize an early gap but it's also really important to re-engage with those folks that you talk to during your empathy phase, ask them questions, have them work through your prototype. So you'll see that this one is really basic. It just uses pen, paper, and markers, um, but it's a great way to learn if something's gonna work before you build it out. Another great low fidelity prototype is a storyboard. So this prototype works really well if you're doing an app or a product, you can build the same kind of low fidelity version of a product. If you're doing a service, this works really well. So build out a framed storyboard, as many frames as you need, be like four or six. The first frame should be the problem and the final phase should be the solution. And then you fill in drawing, see these, I like this image because it's really rough drawings. It's not about how pretty the pictures look, um, but draw out what the experience looks like, describe it and then show it to people and say, if you had this experience, and then ask them questions about your key assumptions. Would you pay for it? Would it meet your needs? And have someone work through this process with you. And then another great one is co-creation. So I mentioned earlier that we each built out what our dream course would look like. We also had students do it. So we said, here are the key elements, build your course for us. And they did, they told us that in their ideal course, community members would have multiple roles. Individual assignments would be only reflection. So all they would need to do without their teammates is reflect. Um, they told us the breakdown they wanted of group versus individual work. They told us how they wanted to receive their grades, that they would get assigned, they would get feedback from both their teaching team and their peers. And we had students build this out and were able to build consensus with the students. So you can have them do this in a way that you're, you're bringing the elements to them, or you could have them arrange their own concept. You just have to be careful with not creating framing because if you don't create structure, you might end up all the way back at empathy where you have all of these brand new ideas and then you have to work through the process again. So again, eventually you've got to move on. So it helps when you go to a co-creation session to say, we are testing this piece and not the entire concept. So here we were testing just these key elements and we gave them options to pick from. And then the key one more time is discussion and making sure that you are having the folks who are actually experiencing these challenges or have the power to make them succeed or fail in the room doing this work with you. If you're just doing it by yourself or with your design team, you're not gonna be able to develop a solution that meets the needs of real people. And that was a really quick introduction to uh, innovation for social impact, especially empathy, co-creation and prototyping. I think we've got just a few minutes for questions if anybody has them. Well, I definitely have a couple of questions, actually. So um, with, how were you introduced to design thinking? Was it through your graduate program? Kind of. I came in a back door. I was introduced to systems thinking first um, and worked with an organization that came into a community, mapped the system. They knew they wanted to solve problems in this community, but first mapped the issues in the community, mapped everything that was going on, and then picked a, a challenge that had the most potential for change. 
And so it came in a back door with systems thinking um, and found design thinking at the University of North Carolina um, when I was there. Great. And then after you guys went through this for your course design, um, what, what was the success rate? Like, did you get a lot of feedback from these students who helped design it? Like, did what did these people who at the end of that last slide that you were talking about with them designing it, what did what was their feedback afterwards? Yeah, so we actually were, we built the course using the feedback of about 10 students and then ran a pilot with 54. Um, and now it's at scale with 150. And so the feedback we got during the course was that it was really helpful. Something we didn't expect was that we used examples in the course of the course design. And we didn't realize how helpful that would be because students were able to experience in real time what it was like to be a part of a solution and be a part of change and feel like their voice was heard. And so we got feedback that it was really successful, that students enjoyed having community partners involved. They enjoyed learning in a nonlinear way. Um, we did not do as well as we could have with community partners because we didn't involve them early in the design process. So we learned a lot about their experience in the course during the pilot, but we didn't know they would be involved when we did the initial empathy work. And so we didn't get their voice at the table until too late. So that was one piece where we got some negative feedback was that the role of the community partners was not clear. Yeah, that's great feedback. It looks like we have a couple questions yeah. um, in the chat. So one of them says, could you repeat and talk more about the photo voice and escape room methods? Absolutely. It might take me too long to click back to those slides. So I'll just talk about them on this slide. So the photo voice method is a tool that you can use kind of for interviewing. So the idea would be that before you interview someone, you give them some work ahead of time. You say, I'm going to give you this camera. I need you to take pictures of your experience with X. And so you'll want to, whatever your challenge is, that's what you want them to take pictures of. And so they'll go through that experience. So for example, if the challenge that you're trying to solve is um, lack of adherence to prescription drugs, you'll take, they'll take pictures throughout, throughout that entire experience. So when are they prescribed the drugs? When do they go to pick it up? What does it look like when they're not taking them? Or what does it look like when they are taking them? And then when you bring them in for their interview, you'll discuss those pictures. And so you'll be able to go through them and you might see some things that they weren't able to tell you. So they might say like, I don't know why I don't take them. I just forget. Um, or I don't know why I don't take them. They like hurt my stomach. Um, and you'll be able to see along the way different points of interaction that you might be able to make a change with. If you do this repeatedly, you'll begin to see trends. And then the escape room method was a um, analogous inspiration method. So we used an escape room because we were looking for something that was nonlinear. And we thought that that was a example of something that was nonlinear, an experience where we could go in, experience something that didn't have a clear start and end. Or like the middle piece was kind of rough. Um, and that's why we use the escape room, but it was an example of analogous inspiration. So anytime that you're looking for something similar to your experience, but not in the same industry, um, and aligned inspiration was when we sat in the classroom. So we did immersion that was really similar to what we were doing. We dove in, um, the analogous was something that was similar, but different. Yeah, those are really great. I love that escape room method. Um, I have another, you know, example of photo voice too. There was this research that was done around food insecurity and, um, this, I can't remember, it might've been like in St. Louis or somewhere in the Midwest. And they were, um, they had people experiencing food insecurity, take photos of their kitchens, of their meals, of their food, like what they were eating. Cause it was easier as like a photo diary um, than it was to necessarily like write down like what they were eating and it also just more inspiring. So they kind of showed like, they ended up finding out like these people are experiencing food insecurity but they're, they are still gathering around their table. Like they're still celebrating and they're still like having family time and like having that photo created that empathy, but also showed like the empowerment that those people could have if they were given the right tools. And it just showed the experience more through their eyes, which I thought was a really amazing tool. Um, and then we also have another question on here. What advice do you have for sponsors of design challenges? Um, I'm going to combine that question with the other one that came in for time um, of what is the like calls to action or the next steps after this webinar. So I'm going to answer that one live. Um, I would say that as you're working through these challenges, create space for empathy. So it's easy to just say, we have this money, we know the problem, we know best, how do we move forward? And so I would say that when you are faced with a challenge, 
make some room and some time for empathy in any way that you can. So this is really easy in a space that fosters uh, this kind of innovation, but wiggle this in any way that you can. Advocate for a week, advocate for a month, three days of doing empathy work before you dive into a solution. Use some of these tools. Um, if you don't have an immediate challenge that you're working on, take some time to just talk to the people who are experiencing your solution. Um, so if you are running a program or a service or a product, take some time to talk to people who are using it, get some insights from them and see if there's any changes you could make to improve their experience. Yeah, that's really great advice. I think it's also important in terms of, um, like you're saying, if you don't have a challenge, you're still creating that culture within your company of inclusive inclusivity of people's experiences, which I think just in the long term builds stronger companies to begin with. Um, so great. Well, Emily, this has been so great. It's been so exciting to have you on. Emily and I work very closely together. So this is really fun. And I love hearing about her research for design thinking. I also did um, a graduate program with a focus in design thinking for nonprofits. So um, this is really just close to my heart as well. Um, so what's coming up next? We have Strat Parrot. Um, who is a VP design director for First Horizon Bank, who is coming to do a webinar on July 20th around crafting an elegant customer experience. Strat is um, a really great speaker and you guys will have a lot of fun listening to him. We also have Brooke Elliott coming and she is gonna be on August 3rd talking about authentic leadership, a continuous journey. And we have Julia Cagle coming on August 12th about design thinking in the everyday classroom. She's a media specialist um, at the Dalton Academy. And then we have Joanna Toma coming August 17th. She's an AVP skills and talent development at Unum. And she's gonna be talking about cultivating flexible skills-based talent, um, a strategy brief from Unum's AVP of skills and talent development. So a lot of really great things coming up this summer. Um, if you guys have any questions or anything, let us know, reach out to Emily or myself, and you can find this recording in your email in the coming days. We're gonna share it with your friends and colleagues. So thanks again for joining us today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Talk to you soon.